So we're back now after the tea break. Hopefully everyone feels a bit more able to focus for the second half of the session. So that'll be in the same um, format as the first half. We got four speakers followed by a Q&A at the end. So please make sure to use the Q&A button to submit any questions. Um, we have some brilliant ones come through originally. Um, and make sure to use our hashtag, hashtag Autistica Festival to engage on Twitter. And also just remember this will be recorded um, and we'll share it after the festival. And we'll also be adding subtitles when we share it after the festival. For those of you who feel you missed a bit of information um, or prefer to read your information, that will be covered. So our first speaker in this half is Robert Chapman. He will be speaking about neurodiversity as scientific paradigm. Um, and Robert is from Bristol, if you want to go. Hi, can you can you hear me? Yep, yep great, thanks. I'll just share my screen. Um, that looks right. Is, it, has my screen been shared? Yep, we can see yep. your full PowerPoint. Great. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, Great, thanks so much then. Thank you for having me uh, back again. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about what I call neurodiversity paradigm science, and in particular, what I'm going to call the ecological turn. And that's a, a term for a change historically in how we're thinking about the mind, and in particular, the, the notion of mental functioning and dysfunctions, which I think is, is a shift that's happening now. Um, and it hasn't completed yet, and I hope this will help clarify it and also make it more, might be helpful uh, as, a, as a tool for thinking about how to orientate science. Um, so to begin, um, what do I mean by neurodiversity paradigm science? Now, I can't give a complete definition of this yet because I don't think the shift has been completed yet but it's something that's happening now slowly. Um, but I think there are three more specific shifts in autism science in recent decades or years, which give a fairly good idea. And I think most people will be familiar with these. So the first is the change from the deficit model to looking at strengths and limitations. So people used to try and find things like a, a core deficit to try and uh, explain everything about autism, and now there's a much more balanced kind of uh, view that there are various strengths and limitations associated with the autistic population. And researchers have been looking into that a lot more, especially in recent decades. Second shift is going from seeing problems as being intrinsic to autistic people to being relational. And that's relational in the sense of being between people. So I think the most important example of this by far is uh, Damian Milton's concept of the double empathy problem. So it used to be thought that autistic people had an empathy deficit and that was intrinsic to autistic people. But the double empathy problem reframes this as a kind of two way relational problem between autistics and non autistics. And Milton proposed that in, in 2012. In a, in a kind of sociological work, but in the last two or three years, uh, people have been doing empirical research, which has, I think, given quite strong preliminary support for this. And thirdly, we've seen a shift away from a uh, medical model more towards a social model, especially when it comes to things like stress and well-being. Um, so I think a, a nice example of this would be the use of the minority stress model uh, in the last couple of years to think about autistic distress um, as stemming more from external factors in an important sense and being more of a social and political issue than an individual medical problem. So these are three specific shifts in autism science, which I think together um, show us something a bit like what we might call neurodiversity paradigm science. And it's important to ask why these shifts have happened. I think there have been two main drivers of the shift. And the first, pressure from autistic self-advocates who have been uh, pushing for, for these shifts for decades, basically. 
and I just think more recently researchers have been or more researchers have been listening um, and therefore changing the kind of questions they ask and changing the science basically. Um, the second really important uh, driver is an increase in autistic autism researchers and also participatory autism research where autistic people are invited to help design experiments and so forth. Uh, so this is really important too. Um, but I think we need to keep doing these things. Uh, we need to do them much more than we do now. Um, but I think we can also supplement this by thinking of the general shift uh, as, as a conceptual shift in how we think about the mind. So my proposal is that we have actually or are seeing a shift from a very individualistic Darwinian understanding of what it means to be functional or dysfunctional. And we're going towards an ecological or what I might call social ecological perspective. Um, so I'm going to explain what I mean by that now. This is my, my, my rather uh, childlike uh, attempt at depicting the uh, individualist Darwinian framework. And um, this is something which I think it's been kind of implicit behind the DSM since the DSM-3 up until today. Um, it's still kind of lumbering on. And the DSM-3 was published in 1980. Um, there was quite a few theoretical models published in, in journals, in psychiatric kind of theory journals and stuff like that, in the years before the DSM-3 was published, which were much more explicit and, and uh, about what they meant by function and dysfunction. But essentially at the time, uh, there had been a crisis in psychiatry. People didn't think it was scientific enough and psychiatrists tried to redefine mental disorder in a way that was continuous with evolutionary biology, or at least the concept of dysfunction was. And evolutionary biologists at the time were, there was a very individualistic conception of function and, and, and dysfunction, uh, which was fairly prominent among people like uh, George Williams and Richard Dawkins who were writing at the time. Um, so, Basically, what these conceptions do is they, they look at individuals as having a fitness propensity level, which is fitness in the Darwinian sense uh, of having a kind of biological advantage or disadvantage. And then you look at the variation in cognitive functioning across the species. And you kind of line people up in a hierarchical way and, and say, you know, who's got the most biological advantage and who's got the least. And people who fall within the what's seen as the norm that's their seen as intrinsically functional on that model. And people who fall outside are seen as intrinsically dysfunctional. And that's people like me, people on the autistic spectrum, as well as other uh, people with uh, other disabilities. So this, this, as I say, this model is still kind of lumbering on today. There are loads of variations of it. Um, and I, mainly because I don't think there is another model yet but it runs into loads of problems. Um, the main one being the kind of overriding problem is that it just doesn't work that well when we apply it to human minds because human minds aren't just individual organisms in competition with each other. This model might work very well in evolutionary biology, but it doesn't work that well with human minds. And I'll give an example to show why I think that now. So, the example I want to give is a fictional one, but I think it brings this out really well. And it also helps us see the shift to, to the ecological way of thinking. So the example, I call it the neurodiverse detective team genre. And this is a genre going back all the way to the uh, Sherlock Holmes. And it continues today in television shows like The Bridge, that's the Scandinavian uh, detective drama. And this genre is defined by there being one neurodivergent detective, often autistic or autistic-like, and then one neurotypical uh, detective. And they work in a team together and solve crimes and argue a lot too. So this is uh, Sherlock, probably the most well-known example, who's more neurodivergent. And then you have Watson, who's neurotypical. Now they work together and their function as a unit is to solve complex problems, to solve crimes. But something really important that I think everyone familiar with this genre will, will recognize is that it takes both of their different kinds of minds working together to solve the crimes. There's what I would call a cognitive division of labor. So 
when we look at it this way, the question is not who is the fittest in the Darwinian sense, who has the most biological advantage. It's how do they work together and what kind of emergent functions and dysfunctions do we see there? Um, so I think it's quite clear that if you had just two Sherlocks, they wouldn't be particularly good at solving crimes. Um, if you had two Watsons, they wouldn't be particularly good at solving crimes. But together they can kind of uh, help see each other's blind spots and they have this emergent function of being able to solve complex problems. This kind of thing is completely overlooked on the individualist Darwinian account because it functions are intrinsic to minds rather than being a relational thing that emerges between them. Um, you also, of course, have emergent dysfunctions. So uh, the double empathy problem, they often misunderstand each other and end up arguing and so forth. A larger scale example um, comes from recent research in cognitive diversity. Now, so far, this research has been mostly in organizational studies looking at businesses. Um, and looking at things like team boards and stuff like that. But what's been found so far is that cognitive diversity helps groups to solve complex problems and also helps group reflexivity. So what that means is the more cognitively diverse a group is, um, in an important sense, the better they are at absorbing change. Also, it's been found to help group intelligence at least at optimal level of cognitive diversity is. Um, sorry. An important implication of this would be that cognitively diverse groups are in a sense more adaptive than cognitively uniform groups. Again, this is all missed on the individualistic models because they don't look at group functioning so much. They just look at individuals in a hierarchical relationship. Um, another very childlike depiction of mine um, as an attempt to, to show what this might look like. Um, so if you see along the bottom, you have all these different kinds of minds, autistic, neurotypical, and so forth. And on this way of looking at functions, none of these kinds of minds are intrinsically functional or dysfunctional, but rather different from each other. And of course, some are disabled, but not dysfunctional. Um, and Functions and dysfunctions are things which are emergent and come out of the various interactions and relationships between these different kinds of minds. I say this is an ecological perspective because this is precisely how ecologists study and talk about function. So when an ecologist is looking at different species, for example, they're not thinking, you know, which, which one of these would uh, be more, more biologically fitter than the other one. Uh, they're thinking, what role do they play in a greater complex system like the ecosystem? And what kind of emer what do they contribute to the emergent functions of the ecosystem, which would be things like the robustness of the system. Um, so this is the model that I think we're seeing emerge, at least implicitly, in this shift in autism science. And I want to say it has three um, actually really helpful uh, things about it. So the first is that it helps avoid stigma and dehumanization. And that's because it doesn't say that anyone is intrinsically dysfunctional. It does acknowledge that there are disabilities and acknowledge that there are dysfunctions, but it doesn't say this kind of mind is inherently dysfunctional and this other one isn't. Um, so that's really helpful. It would be a lot better for research, I think, and for in a way that doesn't dehumanize or that increase stigma. Secondly, it allows us to recognise a far greater variety of functions than the individualist Darwinian models. So all those kind of examples I gave of things which are completely missed on the, on the individualist model, um, they can be captured if we shift science toward these models. And this is especially, of course, we can see the functions of all sorts of disabled people which are overlooked and unduly pathologised on individualist accounts. And thirdly, this model is flexible in terms of fitting with medical and social model analyses. It doesn't necessarily fit with one or the other. It can be used for both where this is necessary or where it's appropriate. Um, so the individualist model is very firmly uh, wedded to an individualistic medical model, um, whereas the ecological model, I think, is a lot more flexible. And importantly, it fits with a much more of a social model analysis. Um, 
Okay, so these are three reasons I think scientists should be going towards a kind of model like this, and I hope more will. And I hope this does some small part to help clarify uh, the shift we're seeing, at least from a historical perspective. Um, so thank you for listening, and I'll just end by saying uh, I go into this in a lot more detail in, in a forthcoming paper. Um, it's forthcoming perspectives on psychological science. There's a free preprint that I have at the link you can see on the screen. Um, so I hope that will be useful. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank um, you, Robert, that was really helpful. And if you want to put the link on from your PowerPoint into the chat, that'd be brilliant, then people can access that. Thank you. Um, Next up, we have Anna Stenning from Bath Spa and a Welcome Research Fellow. Anna, you're talking about all I did was stand up again, what re autism researchers might learn in special, special education. Sorry, that was a long title. Um, good. Okay, thank you. Um, so my research focuses on uh, narratives about autism by autistic people with a focus on published life writing. And this includes autobiography, memoirs, poems, and biography in my definition. I'm approaching this from the perspective of English literature and in particular, the idea that literature can be seen as purposeful communication. So I became interested in this topic because I noticed that disability in general is often absent from studies of literature and because the growing number of non-fictional texts by autistic authors have yet to receive serious literary consideration. And where they have been dealt with, both critics and clinicians have treated autistic autobiography as a straightforward product of a brain registered in choices of language and style, rather than something that may possess distinct literary qualities. Autobiography by even the most popular writers, such as Temple Grandin and Polly Samuels, um, writing as Donna Williams, was accused of either failing to confirm readerly expectations of autism or having deficient narrators, because what they said did not conform to those expectations. Others have suggested that because these texts conform to expectations to some extent, they cannot be the works of autistic authors or they are masking. So I find this frustrating because I think it fails to do justice to the more common sense view that what is distinctive about literature as opposed to an instruction manual or medical atlas is that it leaves room for the reader's interpretive efforts and experiences it also allows room for complex negotiations of self and other that are present in many works of life writing. And when we write about our lives, we seldom have a single concept of self that we are trying to communicate, but want to reflect on the ethical sense of our lives. This response to autistic life writing can be seen as an instance of the more general cultural othering of autism by way of defining it in terms of what seems most interesting to non-autistics, even when it's affirmative. This requires autistics to remain silent, or where their voices are heard, they are reduced to silence or ridicule or even omission. Yet similarly to how women have demanded recognition for their self-knowledge and agency by writing about their lives as part of emancipation, autistic writers from the 1980s have offered alternative narratives about autism in general and their lives in particular. Writers, including Grandin and Samuels, have focused on bodily experience as the basis of self-knowledge while at the same time struggling to reconcile this with the often more powerful voices that would have us question our own interpretations. Uh, Tito Rajashi Mukhopadhyay is an Asian American writer who has gained recognitions for his poetry and prose writing. In writing about himself, he struggles to reconcile his sense of himself with the behavior that makes him appear odd to others. As he wrote when he was eight years old, describing himself in the third person, he saw himself as two selves, one was the complete one, the thinking self, which was filled with learnings and feelings. You could feel the sorrows, joys and satisfactions. You could even create the abstractness in the surroundings. But being in the abstract has already faded away onto the better awareness of the other self. The other self was the acting self that behaved and had no self-control. It was weird and full of actions. The actions which this self displayed were not symmetrical with his thoughts. Others would think that the boy had been taught no manners. The disability theorist Rosemary Garland Thompson has argued that while the body is often how we are recognized as belonging or not belonging to a particular group, it can also be the source of renewed understandings. 
Tito described his many experiences of being removed from educational and social settings because of his tendencies to move and to flap his hands. But these experiences often feed into his, his life writing. For Garland, Thompson writing in Misfits, a feminist material, materialist disability concept in 2015, our outsider status is not inherent to our embodiment, but a result of the identification by others in a particular social and material location. With this in mind, she urges that stories of misfitting can contribute to the formation of a community of misfits that can collaborate to achieve a more libertary politics and praxis. While cognitive psychology has little room for this sort of self-understanding, and literature, literary studies often doesn't have much of a role for the author, common sense has it that we have unique access to our bodily experiences and the suffering and pleasure that these bring. Therefore, while recognising that we might make errors in our recall of our lives, our embodied and private selves can be the grounds for critique. And in line with the material paradigm that informs much contemporary thought, the autobiographical eye of autistic life writing is not disembodied. It is a relational entity that exists in the world of other beings and forces, but this self is not immune to cultural constructions which carry their own baggage. Tito Mukopadai's earliest work was published in 2003 under the title The Mind Tree. It was written by hand when he was between eight and 11 years old. The book came to the attention of prominent commentators, including Lorna Wing and Oliver Sacks, because he appeared to undermine the assumption that to be non-speaking and autistic denied the possibility of poet poetic or metaphorical leaps of the imagination. Yet even with this recognition, or perhaps because of it, Tito referred to himself while still in India as intelligent junk, as an idiot, and then later on as plankton. He said, what use is my intelligence when I hear the rubbish from experts on autism, and yet all I could do is flap my hands, which is to believe to be one of my traits. What use was my intelligence when I hear that I am one of those idiot savants and cannot say my words? So I have renamed myself as intelligent junk. Mukhopadhyay's savant skills consisted in his early and unique literary gift that allowed him to write complex stories about the world around him. But talking about himself and demonstrating his, his self-understanding to others required the tools of language. As he described in The Mind Tree, this meant he could combine the fragmentary self of hands and body parts into a living me, striving for a complete me. The same skill that gave him some freedom to narrate his life in writing and relate to others constrained him to the role of social outsider, which is not the complete picture. His early skills as a poet are demonstrated in the collection Tito's story, which rely on the central metaphor of the mind tree, which is the sentient banyan tree. As an organism that perceives but cannot speak, and therefore cannot confirm his suppositions, he describes himself as in a world full of improbabilities, racing towards uncertainty. The banyan tree upon which the mind tree is based is returned to in his later memoir, Plankton Dreams, from 2015. It describes the walk with his mother. What is the tree doing? Mother, asked, mother used to ask me in India whenever we would go for a walk and encounter a giant banyan tree with long braid-like vines. Monkeys would cling to these vines. She'd expect me to answer photosynthesizing or transpiring or some other poeticism. With mother, life was a constant school and a simple encounter with a tree presented the chance to think of tree-related verbs. As, tree, as Tito contained gained confidence in his abilities to write about his experiences. He was confronted by the realities of how others saw him when he attended a special school in Los Angeles at the age of 12, by which point he had already authored the mind tree. Here he explained the focus of the curriculum was on behavior modification and social adaptation. He explained that there was no educational expectation because it was believed that education is the right of individuals who can voice their language. This is despite the fact that he had tutoring in poetry, literature, and science since childhood from his mother. Plankton Dreams, which Mukhopadhyay wrote some years later about his experiences in special education, is a satire about the misfit between his teacher's expectations and his inner life, reflected in the roles of narrated eye and narrating eye. While his younger self is able to create willful disruptions of the classroom because he knew they would be interpreted as unintentional, his adult self defines these as re resulting from plankton dreams that come from being a living dream, living being that is treated as less than human. In either case, writing and acting out as limited means he has to show who he is. He describes uh, an incident when he's given detention and asked to write some lines. 
as my hands tend to do what they prefer to do, so my mind tends to imagine what it prefers to imagine. In this case, a spaceship of aliens trying to learn the English language. So instead of writing, I will not put my hands inside anyone's bag. I jumble the words, bag, I put hands, one inside, will not win any knot. After I had concoct concocted this stroke-ridden gem, I couldn't stop myself from concocting others. Not will any bag inside put hand my ones. How many ways could I write this sentence? The permutations seemed endless and they began to commandeer my pen strokes. Mr. B had no idea I was closing my eyes as I wrote. While his early autobiographical writings recorded his unusual sensory experiences, this work shows the limited, limiting role of the social context in which they are enacted. While the mind tree and how, I, how can I talk conveyed a world of more than human potential, Plankton Dreams described the lessons he had learned from an education aimed at conformity. After his dismiss from class for not obeying his instructor, instructor reflects on his status as a student. At the lake I had an epiphany. There is a pristine world above the water and a murky reflected one below. There is the typical domain of typical beings who aren't doubted or tested repeatedly and who have a real place in education, work and decision making. And then there is the special domain of special beings where all is shadow, formless and wobbling and hope itself lies sodden and submerged. So like Tito, I have little hope for encouraging genuine recognition for the potential of disclosed autistics to be recognized for our accomplishments. This is because society tends to privilege the outward behavior as a guide to inner experience. And there is also the idea that inexperience does not or cannot exist in autism. There's also the myth that autistics are locked away in something that only experts can remove. But life writing in published on online forum shows that we're reaching out to you and each other. We have plenty to say we should be listened to without being dismissed or ridiculed. I hope that this talk might help to dissuade clinical re autism researchers from reading autistic life writing as evidence of symptoms manifest in style. And for those so inclined, I encourage you to seek out the possibilities of life writing, literature and art as sites, as sites of agency and self-knowledge. Thank you very much for that, Anna. That was really interesting. Um, just a reminder to put all your questions um, in the Q&A and if you got them for a particular person to put their name by it. But it seems like everyone's doing quite well, which is brilliant. Um, so next up, we have Gemma Williams. Thank you for joining us, Gemma, um, who is here to talk about autism communication. Um, you're good to share your screen, Gemma. So, um, okay, can you can you see that? Yeah, we can. Brilliant. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm I'm Gemma Williams, and I'm an autistic. Uh, doctoral researcher at the University of Brighton um, in the final stages of my linguistics PhD. Um, so in this presentation I've got um, a few aims. The first, um, I'd like to describe a little bit of the research that um, I undertook as part of my PhD, looking at communication between autistic and non-autistic adults to give you a sense of um, the context of what I've been doing. Secondly, I'll um, discuss the benefits of grounding interdisciplinary autism research in engaged practices for all involved. And finally, um, I'll share a little um, about what I learned about loneliness and communication, and in particular how they might relate to one another um, and, and what implications this might have for practice or, or future research. So um, the primary focus of my PhD is communication and I've been looking at the, the mutual misunderstandings that can seem to sometimes or often occur between autistic and non-autistic people from the perspective of cognitive linguistics. Um, so 
for this work, I wanted to investigate how some of the features of um, autistic communication that have traditionally been spoken about as pragmatic impairments might benefit from a reframing as being attributable um, to the kind of breakdowns in mutual misunderstanding that the double empathy problem describes. So I know probably for most of you, the, these terms are, are quite familiar, but just in case for those um, for whom they aren't, um, there's been a long, a long held belief um, right back from Leo Kanner's early observations that the pragmatic communication of autistic people, um, so this means the kind of contextual social uses of um, language that rely on inferred implicit meaning um, is impaired. So this might include things like um, not understanding jokes or irony, um, giving inappropriate responses or seeming impolite, um, not reading the room um, and having very literal interpretation of things. And uh, I know it's been mentioned already in this uh, panel, but the double empathy problem is a very persuasive theory originally proposed by Damien Milton that argues that the lack of understanding between autistic and non-autistic people runs both ways. And uh, this is due to what he calls a disjuncture in reciprocity between two differently disposed social actors. Um, and there's also been um, a run of, of studies in the last few years that are finding evidence to support this in various ways. Um, I, I think the, these presentations are being recorded and at the end I've got a, a long list of references so hopefully you can follow them up if you're interested. So I wanted to explore how the double empathy problem might reframe what's been thought of as pragmatic impairment and look at how we might explain this on a cognitive linguistic level. In order to explore these questions, I needed some naturalistic conversation data to analyze. Um, often the linguistic analyses uh, that take place in autism research involve the language use of autistic children in dialogue with their caregivers. So there just weren't any um, pre-made available uh, corpora of uh, adult autistic conversations. So as a result, um, I needed to collect my own. And this is how the Talking Together project was born. So um, the Talking Together project took the shape of a local community engagement project that brought together uh, different people to talk about their experiences of loneliness in Brighton and Hope and to think about potential responses to the problem. It involved eight core autistic participants, each in conversation with, um, firstly, a chosen familiar uh, conversation partner, so a friend or family member, um, an autistic stranger, so one of the other core participants, and a non-autistic stranger. And the, uh, the, the non-autistic participants were recruited through the University of Brighton, through the humanities um, department. A lot of them were students, but not all of them. And participants were given brief prompts at the beginning, just to um, help them begin to reflect on what loneliness meant to them and uh, their experiences of loneliness in Brighton and Hove. And then they were left alone in a room together to have a conversation lasting approximately 10 minutes for each, each conversation. And then these conversations were recorded and transcribed for the primary linguistic analysis. But before I could do any of this, um, or even conceive of the Talking Together project, one of the first tasks of my PhD was to define the key terms of my research. So what is communication and what is autism? And um, as I'm sure you're aware, our present knowledge around both of these concepts um, is informed by a vast breadth of studies and theories emanating from a range of different disciplines. These are some of the disciplines that uh, have informed 
the ideas I've been working with and the list isn't exhaustive. Um, critical autism studies, in case you haven't come across it, is something that's uh, developing out of critical disability studies and there's a little plug for a, a book at the bottom of the screen that's coming out next year um, if you're interested um, to find out more about it. So what I found is that a lot, uh, there's a lot of crossover between many of the core concepts uh, that relate both to autism and social interaction or communication that are being spoken about using different terms across uh, the different disciplines. And likewise, different paradigms approach the same thing from different angles and uh, develop differing epistemologies. A significant risk of having all this knowledge uh, dispersed and diluted between disciplines is what's been referred to as a silo mentality. Um, and this is a kind of insular system of guarding knowledge and methods of knowledge production so that sometimes crucial and relevant information isn't made accessible to those outside of a narrow and specific field of research. And while um, multidisciplinarity can be a useful approach for joining up the contributions of different disciplines and bridging uh, concepts, it's not really feasible for a lone researcher um, to sufficiently master such an array of uh, sometimes conflicting approaches. It's just not possible, not in three years, maybe not ever, probably not ever. Um, so instead, interdisciplinarity um, aims to escape the shackles of a particular, a particular theoretical prejudices and privileged methods. And I think as such, it, ha it begins to have this kind of critical dimension. And the, the criticality is something that's discussed more so when talking about um, what, what's been termed transdisciplinarity, um, which is really just an extension of interdisciplinarity. Um, and this has the additional aim of disrupting hegemonic disciplinary silos um, and opening up equitable and inclusive disciplinary practices that crucially make the visible make visible the silenced voices and hidden histories. Um, it also has the aim of creating new concepts, representations that should also recenter voices from the margins. Um, and to synthesize interdisciplinary theories and methodologies to propose creative, socially responsible solutions. And I think this is where it becomes all the more relevant for autism research. Just checking the time. So um, I'm sure you'll all agree, aligning research with the needs of stakeholders is essential if uh, we want outcomes to be genuinely meaningful. And yet the vast majority of research in autism is still undertaken on autistic people rather than with them, despite the increasing calls for participatory methodologies and the increasing prevalence of them. But in the scale of the kind of volume of autism research, it's still quite, um, quite small. And research priorities still rarely align with stakeholder needs. So part of embracing interdisciplinarity involves listening to marginalized voices and rethinking the hegemonic silos that are founded in historic and systemic privilege really. So returning to my project, um, having decided to create my own data set from scratch, it felt, it felt really important to ensure that the data collection activity was meaningful in its own right for everyone involved. Um, and I can't claim to have planned it this way really, but there was something incredibly poetic about the fact that the content of these conversations oriented around feelings of isolation and marginalization by society. And here was an opportunity for these silenced voices to, to be heard, if only briefly. So in addition to um, being well, an additional benefit of choosing to meaningfully engage autistic people with the creation of the data set is that the data set became multiply valuable. In total, uh, the Talking Together project generated 
245 minutes of naturalistic conversation data. Community engagement around an important issue. Rich qualitative data for a secondary thematic analysis. And I'm working on a paper at the moment with uh, Lisa Quatt from the Brighton and Sussex Medical School to report on those findings. She's presenting on Tuesday morning, I think, uh, on her research into anxiety interventions. Um, you should catch that. Um, it generated uh, meaningful interactions Meaningful interactions were facilitated between strangers with a lot of positive feedback from the participants um, about, about their experience of taking part. And a good working relationship was established between a community partner, a partner, a CERT, Brighton and Hove, who are a brilliant organisation locally, and the university and a CERT have gone on to be involved in an advisory role on another project. Um, so. Um, is that the time? No, it's okay. Um, so yeah, so that, that's built a really great relationship. So the take home point for me is that all of this came about as a direct result of grounding research and engaged emancipatory methodologies where the needs of stakeholder participants are foregrounded. Um, so what did I learn about loneliness and communication? Um, well, my participants spoke about two different types of loneliness that they were experiencing or that they had experienced. The first was a practical loneliness, um, a lack of opportunity to connect with others, to talk or to share. And the second was a deeper loneliness based on a yearning for meaningful connection with others. The interlocutors, the, the participants involved in the conversation, established rapport, flow, and synchrony far, far more effectively when talking with another autistic person, despite the fact that this other autistic person was a complete stranger to them. And this, I think, uh, potentially supports theories that suggest we get on better with those who have similar minds. Having said that, and, and most excitingly, I think, um, there were a few moments of genuine, intimate connections that were made in the uh, pairs of uh, neurodiverse strangers. That's, I should say strangers, sorry. Um, so between autistic and non-autistic people. Um, and many, many of the participants fed back that the experience of talking specifically to a stranger was really rewarding and allowed them to open up in a way that they couldn't normally do in their ordinary life with people that they that they knew um, for various reasons. So it's possible that these kind of conversations promote connectivity even in neurodiverse pairs and this is something I think um, it, it's really worth considering developing. So in summary, um, taking in interdisciplinary approach to autism research allows us to connect science that is otherwise potentially locked into silos. We ought to be ensuring that autism research not only matches the priorities set by stakeholders, but that the experience of participating is also intrinsically valuable to those involved. Embracing the interdisciplinarity that can come from engaged and um, participatory practices can lead to new unexpected avenues of research. I hadn't predicted that I would have um, a qualitative data set that I could uh, look at to find out about loneliness and autism when I started this project. Um, a multiply rich experience for all involved as well as socially responsible solutions to research problems. And finally, uh, creating supportive opportunities for autistic people and non-autistic people to come together to talk about meaningful issues may support neurodiverse connectivity. Um, I have a paper listed in the bibliography that discusses some of these themes about engaged research um, in more detail. And I'm working on a paper with my supervisor, Tim Walton. Hi, Tim. Um, reporting on the linguistic findings. So if you'd like to be the first to hear about those, um, I'll put updates on my blog 
which you can link to there, or um, I'm on Twitter and ResearchGate. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Gemma. That was absolutely very interesting. Um, and again, shows the wide kind of variety of research that kind of fits into quite a broad topic. So last up, and remember to use the Q&A button to submit your questions, um, which we'll do after our last speaker, who is Cons hang on, I've lost my spreadsheet. Constanza Lopez. I think hopefully I'm saying that right, um, who is speaking from Chile and works on disability, social movement and technology. Hi everyone, do you hear me? Yes? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you. I am Constanza, I am um, from Chile, South America. I am currently studying a PhD in interdisciplinary studies on thought, culture, and society. And the, um, the presentation I'm sharing with you today is based on a research I did last year um, that's called Disability, Social Movement, and Technology, a genealogy of the discursive practices of the dissident body of modernity. Um, I want to, I did it and I want to, uh, do this presentation now in memory of Amelia Bax, without whom this uh, research wouldn't have been possible. Um, in case you are interested in reading the whole paper, I can share it with you. You can uh, write me. Uh, it's in Spanish though, but well, uh, Google Translator always, well, most of the times works very uh, well. Um, so, well, I'm particularly today talking about um, the analysis of, the, of uh, Amelia's audiovisual performance. The questions that initially motivated my research were, um, what, uh, were about what epistemological and political truths uh, arise from dis disability social movement and its current deployment, and how have these practices of representation and incarnation conditioned the possibility of codification and resistance of non-hegemonic subjectivities. Uh, well, the research was published uh, this year and it genealogically maps into the history of the present, the network of relationships built by the social movement during the 20th and the 21st centuries in the Anglo-Saxon context, um, which allow it to enter into the diagrams of the political power of modernity. For this, uh, I analyzed scientific literature on the social movement and disability studies, uh, along with um, an audiovisual performance uh, that I am um, particularly addressing today with you. Uh, the sociocultural model uh, of disability uh, is focused on the relational narratives of the person through technologies. The use of technology in activism of new social movements in dispute regarding its oligopolistic characteristics has opened a place of mutation and possibilities for dissident bodies and their subversion of discursive practices um, that might also displace relations of force. Uh, this model allows us to understand disability as that hybrid and embodied subjectivity that denotes the marks of technological change in the body. Uh, what some authors might call the cyborg figure characterized by raising issues of human rights and interdependence, providing a transcendent vision to the limits of normality, thereby making visible its membership to the range of beings qualified as human and non-human that inhabit our societies. I, sorry. Amelia, Bax was an activist connected transnationally thanks to technology, a member of uh, the self-defense movement of people considered disabled. Um, um, Bax released a video a title in my language more than a decade ago. And uh, the audiovisual stage uh, in this video is made up of um, everyday home spaces. And for the first five minutes, what you see is part of um, Bax's practices of daily life, working back and forth, rubbing um, fingers against a computer keyboard, burying the face between pages of the book and hitting a pendant, pendant necklace. The seemingly, seemingly involuntary and random movements uh, might seem from a person lacking the communication skills typical of the modern canon of rationality, 
which bags does not conform to based on the medical diagnosis of physical, psychiatric, and developmental disabilities, um, bags received throughout um, life. So after the introduction to words appear on the screen, this evoked the questioning by the autism and scientific community about Bach's diagnosis and led to Bach's being accused of fraud due to certain inconsistencies in medical and personal history. The introduction, introduction in the video gives way to the voice of an artificial synthesizer software that articulates after Bach's digitizing on a keyboard what happens inside the head. Due to various social and health difficulties, Bax belatedly learned to speak and stopped doing it as a teenager. Artificial synthesizer softwares are, are part of assistive technologies for communication. They are grouped in augmentative and alternative systems and constitute intervention and strategy systems and aimed at the recovery or, uh, and or the development of previously lost or non-existent abilities. And they presuppose that communicative interactions fulfill specific purposes. Among these systems is facilitated communication, which consists, consists of the facilitation through a physical act of support on the person's hand so that one can write or type the messages. So that the person can write or type the messages. And research around the latter has been questioned by the scientific community for its low objectivity, challenging this, the absence of empirical studies that may, may require design and control criteria. Facilitated communication has therefore been classified as ineffective by the literature focused on the treatment of autism. However, according to one of the main promoters of this type of services, the approach differs precisely because it does not presuppose a social cognitive deficit, but rather focuses on potential abilities. A phenomenological sociology of disability approach reveals that in the communicational choreography, the ableist nature of temporal norms mean that people with speech impairment, for example, might deny, might find it now impossible to acquire and sustain the physical and cultural capital necessary to participate in everyday social encounters. The choreography of the spatial temporal domains tends therefore to reinforce the exclusion and estrangement of people with speech impairments. All of these readings led uh, me to ask myself what would the investigation of communication assistance technologies be like if they did not start from normalizing developmental uh, criteria that presuppose a deficit or absence of ability, but opened up to stress that normative communication ability anchored to an intention that can be codified in the arbitrary, arbitrary rationality of signifiers and meanings, and is also classifiable according to indicative compliance purposes. So what would happen to this normative communication ability if it was stressed from, quote, disability imaginaries, close quotes, that think, speak, gesticulate, and feel from other ways of driving perceptions, mobilities, and times. Back's use of assistive communication technologies does not imply a physical act of facilitation, but it breaks the rational normative discursive structures of communicational choreography and the humanistic subjectivity of the enlightenment, blurring the borders between human beings and machines, the latter being perceived as prosthetic and intimate components where there are also new forms of representation and production of forms of identity and subjectivity. Depending on the purposes of use, technologies can be aimed at normalization or as in the case of back at subverting practi practices in non demonic resistance processes. Back's subjectivity remains in the semiotics of a transitory, transitory relationship challenging the notion of a Cartesian interiority of significant language that nevertheless emerges with the use of technology. The activation of, of Bach's senses of touch, st uh, touch, taste, and smell allow Bax to hold a constant conversation in co-presences of other inorganic bodies in the environment, thus constituted what Bax calls um, native language. The inheritance of Roman law projected to modernity the processes that make it possible to define a person as the one who maintains the living part of him, her, themselves, his, her, their body, subject to the domination of another. The interior of the singular individual is divided into two spheres, and from the greater or less intensity of deanimalization will derive the assigned degree of humanity and put the difference in principle between who can be fully defined as a person and who can be defined only under certain conditions." Close quotes. So I ask myself, under this logic, do the body minds considered disabled constitute a part of the people's subject of rights? 
what quote conditions close quotes do they face are they part of the principles of equality and freedom enacted at the end of the 18th century Bax, I think, stresses the modern scientific objectivity with which disability has been intervened and normalized and fictionalized in other ways and other ends of communicating through symbolic and immanent non-relational language. This fictionalization, this fictionalization could temporarily and spatially suspend the modern rational subjectivity and the dichotomous process that transforms rational beings into people capable of mastering their, quote, bestiality, close, close quotes. So, is it possible to imagine other modes of rights, not atomized, but in imminent connection to the world without the abstract domination of the symbolic instituted in human rational language and other ways of being there for subjects of them outside the modern liberal rational paradigm, outside the idea of property, to move towards interdependence as a way to create new forms of relationship and habitability? Could we perhaps thus experience other modes of situated and embodied knowledge? What impact would this have for scientific research, for public normalizing policy and the life experiences of dissident bodies and minds. Um, I already told you that um, this research is, is part of a broader research where I address the, uh, the way capitalism uh, and its development is imbricated with um, what during the Enlightenment and during the 18th century happens. Um, uh, relating to the management of a uh, population and the creation, the configuration of the categories of uh, disability, and also how um, uh, the new conceptualization of the body is also implicated uh, uh, temporarily during that um, period of time. But I didn't address this uh, here in this presentation because I thought it would be too long. But well, that is uh, uh, in more detail in the in the paper I I can share with you um, if you if you write me. I want to end uh, this presentation uh, with the kind of long quote of Bags in in the video uh, that I think reflects well uh, part of the aims that I, I wanted to explore in my research. And I think it is also a very um, good uh, quote to remember uh, given our current pandemic situation worldwide. So I'm going to read, uh, read it to you. Quote, I want you to know that this has not been intended as a voyeuristic freak show where you can get to look at the bizarre workings of the autistic mind. It is meant as a strong statement on the existence and value of many different types of thinking and interaction in a world where how close you can appear to a specific one of them determines whether you are seen as a real person or an adult or an intelligent person. And in a world in which those determine whether you have any rights. There are people being tortured, people dying, people they, they are, because they are not considered, they are considered non-persons because their kind of thought is so unusual as to not be considered thought at all. Only when the many shapes of personhood are recognized will justice and human rights be possible. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Constanza. Um, brilliant. So if we, if you can just stop sharing your screen. Absolutely. Sorry. Yes. There. Brilliant. And then Constanza, Gemma, um, Robert and Anna, if you'd like to join us again. Brilliant. So we'll move on to a Q&A section. We got some really good questions in. Um, so the first question I'm going to ask is for you, Anna, directly. Um, though obviously anyone else can join in because I think it overlaps a bit and it just asks what recent literature do you think portrays autistic people and their experiences in a positive manner um, and it's a two-part question what literary tropes are is autism often viewed through and how do you think this has affected understanding as a whole so that's quite a lengthy question yeah I might need a reminder of the second part if that's okay um so for the first part, what recent literature um, represents autism in a positive light, mm -hmm. is that right? So um, I think there's a book by um, James McGrath, who's a, another 
um, autistic literary critic, and he, he explores quite a lot of uh, different representations of autism in culture, um, in literature in particular. And um, I think he's, um, so he also talks about poetry. Um, I think um, sort of generally his view is um, that the more affirmative or the more um, helpful representations are generally authored by autistic writers. Um, and um, although there are kind of, um, there seem to be a few um, fictional representations that kind of do that justice yet. Um, so I do, I know that there are some recent um, works of literature by autistic authors that, um, that I haven't yet had a chance to read as many of them as I'd like. Um, focusing as I am on nonfiction at the moment, but I do think, um, I think that's where we're going to see the more affirmative representations. So the second part was, sorry, could you? Yeah, so the second part was asking if you thought there was kind of a literary trope that autistic characters and autism in itself is more often viewed through. Yeah, I mean, um, again, uh, James McGrath book looks at that in a lot of detail um, and he talks about how in the 90s the um, the kind of um, savant stereotype was very much um, dominating cultural representations um, partly because of the popularity of, of film of the film Rain Man and that basically was autism in most cultural representations I think that sometimes still exists particularly in the kind of detective uh, version um, but I think starting, I think certainly by um, self-representation online in particular, that's starting to be complicated. Um, so there's lots of really interesting subject. I don't think I've quite been able to do that just. I wonder if any of the other panelists have any thoughts on that. Cool. We'll let that one go there. I think yeah. there's probably a lot to be said, as you say. Some of these questions are quite hard to answer on the spot. Um, speaking of hard questions to answer on the spot, um, Robert, I've got a question for you, which is about, um, I'll just read it out rather than try and um, summarise it because I would probably make it more confusing. Is, do you think a compromise or transitional measure is to add potential strengths to the official classifications? We have heard that hyperfocus can be a selective advantage, for example but it can also be contextually disabling. Um, yeah, what do you think? Right, yeah, so I, if I've understood correctly, this is about just, because we currently have these deficit uh, classifications, which are all about deficits, and we could add some strength as well to make them more balanced. Um, I guess I would say it would be less bad to make remake the classifications like that but I don't think it would be particularly good either um, I think that's still when it's just when it's just uh, an issue of strengths and deficits or, or so forth then that's still looking at things for an extremely individualistic kind of hierarchical model um, so that way of thinking is still very much in the, the the Darwinian sort of paradigm that I want to move away from and I think we we are slowly moving away from um, if it's not supplemented by the other changes as well um, yeah, so it, as a transitional measure, I guess it, it would be less bad, but it's, it's certainly, for me, it's not the, the goal. I don't think, um, I mean, but I, I don't even know what a strength really means because what can, what can be a strength in one context can be, you know, uh, a, a weakness in another context. That's probably not the best word, but what can be adaptive or can be maladaptive or, or so forth, um, so I think we need a much more nuanced way of, of describing these traits. Um, I call them value neutral, and that's to say that they can, that on the, as such, they're value neutral because they can be good in some contexts and bad in other contexts. Um, yeah, I hope that answers. Yeah, I mean, Gemma, do you want to join in? Do you have anything to add? Um, let me find. So there, there was a there was a sort of related question. Was is that, um, I I think that so I could answer a sort of slightly different question. Yeah, related. I'm trying to find it. Um, I think it was asking about um, about engaging 
so this is a different question, sorry, um, about engaging uh, neurotypicals with the uh, the debate around the double empathy problem. Yeah, um, I think... So I'll just read that question out loud. Yeah. So, so it says, this is to Gemma and Robert, with regards to the double empathy problems, do you feel that more needs to be done to engage neurotypicals in this debate? who may not see this as an issue for them since they are in the majority. And what ideas do you have about this in literature, dramatization, scientific articles, et cetera? So I carry on, Gemma. Yeah, yeah, well, I think it's a really good question. I think it is really, it's re it, it, it would be really important to raise the awareness um, of, the, of the double empathy problem and related issues um, among non-autistic people because, um, you know the nature of it is that it's a two-way, two-way problem, and if only one person's aware of it, it it's very difficult to. Um, it makes it harder to to address it. But um, and and I think the, the person who asked the question is right that it's not something that that a a non-autistic person would necessarily have to think about in the first instance. You know, I don't know. Perhaps even no. I, I won't. I was going to make an analogy, but I won't. Um, but I think. Yeah, from what I kind of took from my research is that creating um, meaningful op opportunities to interact between autistic and non-autistic people focused on kind of shared, um, I don't know, shared interests or shared issues where the double empathy problem and the communication problems aren't necessarily foregrounded, but it it allows for these moments of connection to occur. And then, you know, awareness raising can be built into it. So I'm kind of, so in terms of what, I, what I'd like to see is maybe like larger scale um, community engagement projects involving autistic and non-autistic people where they're kind of problem solving any, anything really. And then the, um, the double M3 issues are kind of like drip fed into it. I don't know if that's a helpful answer. That's really interesting. Robert, do you have anything to add? Because I know the question was addressed to both of you. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that was a fairly comprehensive answer. So, uh, uh, I, I guess I would. So one thing I, I think I was just I was just thinking of Damian Milton's original paper on the double empathy problem, and mm. it does emphasise that it's uh, in a sense the neurotypical is is more disabled because they are in this, um, they're, they're the more powerful one in the power relationship in a kind of uh, uh, systemic and structural way. So yeah, we do need to be very careful of not just thinking of it as a problem between two different kinds of minds that might be, you know, misread each other. That's part of it, but it's also that there is a kind of epistemological ignorance on, as there are in all, all such relationships in the way that uh, you know, um, males often won't be able to, to understand the um, mm. things that females face um, and white people won't be able to understand the things that black people face and these kinds of things. I think there's something, a kind of structural epistemological ignorance going on there uh, too. Yeah, that's... Thank you. Anna, I'm just going to move a question on to you. I mean, it might not be relevant to you at all, but I'm just wondering is kind of double empathy and this idea of kind of cross understanding something that you kind of come across in your work at all? Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's very much um, very relevant to the idea of, of the, um, the reader as a, as a kind of mediating force in the text. I don't think it's necessarily something we talk about enough in literary studies, um, which is the idea that the reader does bring um, kind of their own experiences and perspectives um, in a kind of co-construction of the text. And I think there's def a definitely a distinctive um, reading from an autistic reader or, or somebody who, or, or from, from everybody brings their cultural kind of experiences um, to the construction of the text. And I think um, it's unfortunate that so far the readings that have influenced um, perception of autistic life writing have mainly been from um, the other side of the neurological kind of divide. Um, so I do think it's relevant. Thank you. Um, Constance, do you have anything to add? I mean, is there something that comes across when looking at the body 
I guess, as well as the mind. Um, I'm really, I'm sorry, I'm really new at Zoom, so I don't know how to use it very well. And I just, I just, well, I was just looking at the, um, at the question box. And I found a, a question that uh, was um, referred to um, how, oh, if, I, if um, there is a role for human rights law uh, in redefining what is meant by disability so that people uh, are not boxed into by, in, are not big, boxed in by unhelpful social constructs, but also obtaining the right to support, avoiding becoming a non person. I know this is not. Uh, yeah, so what uh, you think? yeah, I'm just changing the question. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's actually related a bit. So yes, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> um, and I do think there's a role for human rights law. I I think um, well, my my view on rights is is particularly critical, and and I would say. Uh, at least for the research I did, where I included the analysis of the performance, is very Marxian and materialistic. So um, I think rights are based on a on a material distance between um, the reality of people who uh, who experience inequality. <laughs> And the idea uh, of uh, this subject of rights that um, is also a subject that is meant to be free and is meant to experience equality in a political community where uh, everything is supposed to be organized towards that. Uh, I, from a critical point of view, um, rights discourse um, is based on the idea of a subject that does not include women, does not include people who are considered uh, disabled or have a body minds that are actually othered mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, strictly speaking, the rights discourse. So uh, I think there's a, there's a huge distance between a former, a former principle of rights and the material realities of women, of people considered disabled, of black people, et cetera, et cetera. All these other populations that uh, do not um, wholly uh, enter this idea of the subject of rights. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the reasons why social movements are so important, politicized social movements. They are actually mobilized uh, towards this idea of, uh, of, um, of the subject of rights, where um, many times uh, we were from the beginning excluded from the beginning of the idea of a political community, for example, not only in modernity, but one might trace it even um, even more, I, I, I forgot the word in English, but my, one might trace it even more backwards <laughs> in history. Um, so I do think that uh, human rights law um, should be redefined, but I think that for that to happen, to happen and um, really gain something in that, social movements are crucial. Um, I don't think redefining just the discourse is enough for material realities and uh, the experience of our bodies and our minds to change and to uh, be able to actually achieve a structural change that is not only based on the structures, the physical, the material structures, but also the semiotic and symbolic dimension of the change we need for our divergent body minds to be able to deploy and move in the world uh, in a in a way that also the world is made for us and not um, adapted in specific cases. 
Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask one question just briefly to all of you and then I think we'll have to finish up. So this question I asked to um, the first four as well. Sorry, I uh, muttered it myself, by the way. Sorry, I muttered, oh God, because I pressed the wrong button. If that, and then I realised I wasn't muted. And did you hear the question? I know my internet's being a bit glitchy. Oh, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> We're doing well. Um, so it's basically how your own background and experience in autism has kind of, how you've approached your own research and the topic, I guess. Ooh. Um, I can answer. I, I've got a, a quick answer. Um, yeah, that would be brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, um, I had my autism diagnosis quite late in life, about five or six years ago. And I had had such frustrating experiences all my life of um, experiencing these kind of communication breakdowns or lack, lack of understanding. And I felt like I was being really articulate and the person I was talking to was being really articulate, but we just couldn't understand each other. And so that probably uh, influenced my wish to work out well, what's going on. It's not really about, I don't think it's really about um, linguistic competence as you might kind of characterize it, um, you know, pragmatic competence. It's much more about this interactional, um, it, it's in the interaction is much more about um, two different kinds of minds trying to relate. So that's, that's how I got into it. Thank you. Um, do any of you else want to share your sort of side of this? Um, if, if, does anyone else want to go first? All right, I can go. Okay. There's a, for, just for me briefly, it was, um, I, I didn't know I wanted to go into autism research, but I, I was already studying philosophy and then I didn't know there was a philosophy of autism or ethics of autism. Um, and then I started reading what some pe people, non-autistic people had written on this and it was just uh, so incredibly dehumanizing and um, ignorant and um, it made me uh, just want to do something and to, to kind of combat that. So um, gen general earlier life experiences, of course, as everyone has of discrimination and um, marginalization and all these kind of societal disablement but then yeah uh, coming across a few particular books I won't uh, mention which ones which um, made me feel like th th there needs to be more <laughs> autistic people doing philosophy and ethics um, to uh, show that different perspective thanks thank you and it's interesting even within medical humanities philosophy is still quite a underrepresented kind of angle so mm. Anna do you want to add anything yeah, um, your sure. experience yeah I, I'm quite happy to talk about that um I think like Gemma I had my diagnosis quite late it was about uh five years ago and it was after my PhD so I, I was already studying literature and um I was my main focus was nature writing and I'd kind of got to the point where I wasn't quite sure if I was still interested in carrying on in academia because I felt like some of the questions that we were looking at weren't really getting to the heart of what were what was our situation in the world as, as human beings and i think there's not often a recognition of our vulnerabilities um which are often part of what makes literature interesting it was it was particularly um chris packham's memoir uh, fingers in the sparkle jar that made me realize that actually that our embodiment our kind of alternative um, perspectives make a complete difference to how we represent the natural world. Um, so it kind of started from there that um, that there was something in particular to be said about literature um, in relation to autism and disability in general, but also that autistic writers had um, a kind of distinct way of representing the world, um, which was worth considering. So that's a little bit about it. <laughs> Thank you. And Constanza, just to finish up with you, I mean, how did you come across Melanie Biggs and kind of the body as well? How did you end up that being your research topic? 
I started my PhD last year and I worked for many years in, in an NGO. Um, I entered the PhD in a specific la uh, in research line that was uh, politi uh, political culture, memory and human rights. But uh, while I was uh, in uh, the program, I decided to change my research line and I um, started uh, researching um, specifically in, in the area of feminist disability studies, uh, well, and also disability studies. So the reason why I, why I uh, deepened in uh, how, and I want to also continue it, uh, uh, continue the, uh, I want to explore how uh, the body is uh, semiotically and materially configured. Uh, and I think uh, feminist disability studies uh, and general studies have a lot to do with that, with why I, I uh, got interested in in the configuration of the body. Hello, <laughs> I'm Kat. I also work at Autistic. It looks like we have lost Beth. Oh, Beth and Raby has returned. Yes, she has. I'll give you back control, Beth. And... Oh, you're on mute. Okay. We're doing well for the last seconds of the thing. I was just saying, we've got a bit of a storm happening outside, which I think is affecting our internet. Um, thank you very much for your answer, Constanza. I heard the majority of it before I disappeared. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you everyone very much for speaking. All eight of you have been absolutely fantastic. And I know, for one, I really look forward to re-listening to this um, and taking notes when I don't have to host at the same time. Um, things obviously we've got a quiz tonight so if you want there's still time to join that I mean, now um, just for you all to share obviously you can follow discover of information like this and um, I guess this is happening all next week so there's a lot more talks to come so join in join in on Twitter and thank you again for coming and listening and speaking. Thank you. <laughs>